The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip, and he said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, Here is truly an Israelite to whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I find our Old Testament reading this morning very interesting and even a bit humorous. What Wilson read earlier is, is early in the book of Samuel. We call it 1 Samuel, but the two books were originally one bigger book. And the Torah, the Jewish Bible, still maintains that. The creation of the two is because when the book was translated to a scroll in Greek, it was too long for one scroll, so it was divided. The original Hebrew doesn't have vowels, so the addition of those made it much longer. So now we have two. Samuel is pretty early in the history of Israel. Israel is still very new to their faith. They frequently fall prey to outside forces, easily following other gods. They may not literally be wandering in the desert any longer, but for sure they are figuratively wandering, unstable, not yet found their place in the world. God had used prophets to lead them, not wanting to resolve to a monarchy. God knows that kings would become corrupt. God knows that kings would rule unjustly and would squeeze God out of the picture if they were given the opportunity. God wanted to be their king, but the people just wouldn't have it. They felt they needed an earthly king. So the books of Samuel tell a history of that change, telling of God's movement in the Israelites to move God's people forward where before they didn't really have a land and they didn't really have a direction. We learn in Samuel how God brought about God's will and created a more stable people with a land and a direction. The book of Samuel is the story of the prophet Samuel from his birth to his anointing kings of Israel. He was another one that seemed to be ordained before birth to God's work. God planned to use Samuel even before he was conceived. Samuel's mother was Hannah, who was said to be barren. She prays to God in the temple and pledges to God that if she were given a son, that she would give him to God to live in the temple forever. Well, God answers her prayer, and she holds to her vow. So at a young age, Samuel goes to live in the temple, where Eli, 
is the priest. That's where we get to today's scripture. And our scripture today reminds us that the word of God was rare in those days. Where once prophets like Moses would see visions, now they were nearly absent. Many of the Israelites were lost, wandering. For instance, Eli's own sons, who were also priests, were scoundrels, as mentioned in chapter 2. And scoundrels might be an understatement, and taking it modestly. But today's scripture is the second time that we read in Samuel that God has gotten word to Eli that God will remove him and his family from their priestly duties. They aren't fit for it. God's new plans for Israel and Eli and his sons are not part of those plans. We read that Eli's eyesight was getting dim. That refers not only to a physical shortcoming, but probably more importantly, it refers to a spiritual blindness. I find this story from Samuel a bit comedic. Picture it with me, will you? Here we have Samuel lying down late in the night. Suddenly he, see, suddenly he hears his name, Samuel, Samuel. Even though he has, he has spent much time in Eli's presence studying the word of God, he doesn't recognize the word or the voice of God. He believes it to be Eli. So he jumps up calling, here I am, and he runs to Eli, who we presume is asleep and is also the only other person in the temple. When he gets to Eli, Eli says, I didn't call you to go back to sleep. So back he goes. Then it happens again. Samuel is lying there and he hears his name. Samuel, Samuel. Again, he jumps up and he runs to Eli. And again, Eli tells him, I didn't call you, go back to sleep. Once again. So back Samuel went to his resting place. After some time, it happens. Samuel hears, Samuel, Samuel. Once again, he goes to Eli. Now I can't believe he's running quite as fast as he was the first time. But maybe he is. And once again, Eli tells him he didn't call him and to go back to sleep. But this time, he adds something else. And we need to give Eli credit here. After hearing that his eyesight, his spiritual eyesight, was growing dim, Eli had enough spiritual presence to add to his instructions. He added to his instructions to Samuel beyond to go back to sleep. For Eli perceived that it just might be God that was calling Samuel's name. So Eli added, to not come to him, but rather to stay there and to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So back to his bed he went. And just like the times before, God spoke, Samuel, Samuel. But unlike the previous times, Samuel didn't pop up and run to Eli. This time he did as instructed. And he said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Then God speaks to Samuel. God tells what God is... Let me say that again. God tells that God is about to do a new thing, a new beginning. I love this part here in, in this verse where God tells Samuel that, that he will make both of his ears tingle. Isn't that what we experience or expect when we hear God's voice in our lives? And like Samuel, God already knows us and calls us by name. God called Samuel and told him of a new thing. And remember, anyone who hears this new thing will have both their ears tingle. A similar thing happens in our gospel lesson from John. John doesn't tell us 
in our gospel lesson, but I have to think that Nathaniel's ears were tingling during his conversation with Jesus. For like Samuel, Nathaniel didn't expect what happened either. I see what I think to be another funny interaction. An interaction in the scripture from John. See, Philip found Nathanael and told him that they had found the guy that Moses and the prophets told them about. Jesus of Nazareth. And I get a chuckle out of Nathanael's response. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was a very unlikely place for the Son of God to come from. But Jesus calls Nathanael by name. Jesus knows him before he meets him. And this is where I have to believe that both of Nathanael's ears tingle. He just knew that God was doing something new. God continues to make our ears tingle, to do something new. The Israelites in Samuel's times were lost. They wandered, they complained, and were quick to follow other gods. We're different, but we're not at the same time. Our political system can't seem to do anything but argue. Countries want to close themselves off to anyone not like them and fight anyone that dares cross the line. Countries and peoples want to grab more than their share. A growing difference between rich and poor. There seems to be nowhere that's safe from some sort of violence. An encounter with road, with road rage is but a short drive from our door. And a harsh word is but a breath away. Maybe we aren't all that different from the early Israelites. But again, God knows our name and calls us to a new thing, a new beginning. Making our ears tingle. That's how it was for Samuel and Nathaniel. So it must be so for us. God knows and understands what we go through. God knows the mess we have. But most importantly, God has a plan. God has made a new covenant with us and calls us to a new beginning, a new thing. And like Samuel and Nathaniel, God is calling us to action. To not only proclaim that new thing, but to live it. Maybe we aren't anointing kings like Samuel, telling them of God's will for them, but we can be a blessing to someone dealing with the struggles of life. Maybe we can't walk in the desert with Jesus as, a, as his disciple like Nathaniel, but we can definitely be a disciple in Bluefield, sharing our lives in Christ. God's call will likely be unexpected. At an unexpected time, like when we are lying down, or from an unexpected place, like Nazareth. From an unexpected person. Regardless, God makes our ears tingle and our lives new. As disciples and as the church, we are called to be that unexpected, to hear for ourselves but to help others hear as well. For everyone that hears will have both their ears tingle. And as the church, we are to lift each other and to support each other to that new beginning, that new thing that comes in the light and life of Jesus Christ. On this eve of Martin Luther King Jr. Day, I think it's very appropriate to share some of his words. Life's most persistent an urgent question is, what are you doing for others? 
Every person must decide whether he or she will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Let us pray. O oh God, you know us intimately and call us by name. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. You give us to each other to know and to love as we journey in this life. Guide and direct us as we live into this new thing. Our ears tingle with the revelation of your kingdom. Show us your will for all creation. And now let the church respond with, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. In the name of the Holy Trinity, one God, now and forever. Amen.